Okay guys, and welcome to Glenn's Car Collection. Today's video is gonna be how to get a great deal on a used car. Uh, a couple weeks ago, a month ago, I did a how to get a great deal on a new car. This is how I get great deals when I buy a used car. I prefer, this car actually, GLA 45 AMG is my latest car that I bought used. It's a 2015 model, the 2016s are out right now. Uh, I typically prefer to buy from a private individual over a dealership because A, you'll get a better deal. A dealer, you know, he's got to pay the rent. He's got to pay for that big expensive showroom. He's a professional, so he's going to sell that car for top dollar where the private guy, car enthusiast, is not going to be able to get the top dollar. Dealer can because he cannot offer uh, financing. You know, you got to get your own financing when you come to him. But I like private owners because you want to buy from a car enthusiast and you want to buy a car who's very meticulous, a uh, private individual, and who has the service records. So a guy that really loves his car will have a receipt for every oil change he ever did. I don't think it matters whether he changed the oil or he paid somebody to do it, but the fact that he did it. Uh, you know, you typically want the car oil changed, you know, once a year, maybe uh, if a guy has a lot of cars every 18 months, but after that it starts to degrade. You know, I've looked at a lot of low mileage cars with 5,000 miles and the car, guy only did one oil change over five years because he goes, oh, I didn't drive the car. Well, the oil is still degrading whether you drove it or not. So, one of the first steps to buying a used car is know what you want to buy. So, uh, you know, if you want an all-wheel drive car, don't look at two uh, two-door convertibles, right? So pick exactly what you want to buy. So I wanted a car that I could use for the winter since it snows where I live in northern New Jersey uh, and we got a lot of salt on the road, a lot of ice on the road. So even if we only get, you know, five or six snowstorms a year, depending on the winter, uh, you know, we usually get a couple that are over a foot. Uh, last year we had really just one or two storms, but the one storm we did was three feet of snow where I live. So I wanted something that's all-wheel drive and, you know, the roads are icy for three months in the winter so even if there may not be any new snow all that water freezes over and turns to ice and i'm out late at night playing hockey so i want a uh, safe car so just to make sure uh before settling in on an all-wheel drive car i drove a lot of rear wheel drive cars i have driven a uh an e90 m3 in the snow in the winter uh for a bunch of years i was the original owner of one i had it five or six years had uh blizzax on it and it was great so I, I can drive a rear wheel drive car in the snow. I even had a Cayman S that one winter. I got a great deal on winter tires from a guy who traded in his Cayman and I drove that through the winter with snow tires. You know, again, you're really just limited by ground clearance. If you're stopped on a hill uh, on a rear wheel drive car, sometimes you could, you could roll back or have, traction, have uh, trouble getting traction up that hill, but you can do it. So I looked at everything because I wanted a car that can fit my hockey equipment plus four adults, it didn't have to necessarily fit them at the same time, because when I go to hockey, I'm going there by myself. So first I looked at some rear wheel drive cars. I looked at an E63 AMG, which is great. Unfortunately, the one I found was heavily modified, so I passed on it. I found a nice F10, F10 M5. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't a stick shift, it was a dual clutch, which was very good. Uh, but I ran into a shady dealer. I found a nice blue one, but the dealer was very shady into the bait and switch, so I literally walked out of the dealership. And then I found uh, a good one in another dealer for a great price, but I just hated the color. It was like a brown color. So I looked at those cars. I thought maybe a big luxury car, since I do a lot of highway driving and I have all these sports cars. I looked at a, uh, an older Audi A8. It was fine. But it was probably a little too big for me. I really didn't need that giant back seat. Uh, it was the long wheelbase model. And, you know, it wasn't sporty. It was a good car, but it wasn't sporty. Uh, I drove a 2013 Audi S6, and I thought that was phenomenal. And it was blue, the color I wanted. I would have bought that on the spot, but a couple things. Uh, there was a bubble, and the tire needed to be replaced. The car was out of warranty. Uh, there really were no service records from it. It was a dealer who had a good reputation, so I probably would have taken a chance on that car. Unfortunately, I went back a second time probably to close the deal, and literally somebody else was test driving it and bought it on the spot, so I lost that. I like to get good deals on the car, so to me that car was about $5,000 overpriced. 
So if I don't get a good deal on a car, I walk away because you know what? Tomorrow you'll find another one. There are enough used cars around. That's one of the things you got to figure when you go to the dealer is you can leave. They'll, you know, they want you to buy. They have no power to stop you walking out the door. So you really have all the power uh, rather than them. The only uh, situation where they'll have the power over you is if you're counting on them to get financing. You should really get your own financing first, and then you kind of take that out of the equation. Dealers want to finance you. They'll actually make more money financing you because they're going to charge you a higher interest rate. So get your own financing first. Get a loan from your bank uh, or your credit union so you have your financing in place, and then you kind of take that whole thing out of the equation. I also use YouTube videos. I look at YouTube car reviews. So when I thought about the GLA 45 AMG, I thought, all right, well, what do my favorite car magazine and YouTube car reviewers think? And everybody loved this car, this GLA 45 AMG. Now, for those of you that know, before I had the M2, which is over there, I had a CLA 45 AMG. So I kind of knew what I was getting into. Uh, basically, all my quibbles with the CLA 45, which I liked very much, uh, were fixed with the GLA. Uh, the, I had a first year CLA 45, which is a 14. The dual clutch transmission wasn't quite there yet. Now with the uh, 15 model year, they really improved it and is tremendously approved on uh, all 2015 models. Also, I couldn't fit adults in the back seat. Being six feet tall, I couldn't fit in the back seat. And then the trunk, though it had plenty of room, had a tight opening uh, to fit my hockey bag. So basically a hockey bag is equal to like two golf bags, but you can kind of crumple it down. So the GLA solved all those problems. Also, the CA, CLA had a lot of understeer. It's really a front wheel drive based car, and it only goes into all wheel drive when it slips. The, uh, the GLA has a much shorter wheelbase, and in manual mode, it, it really drives close to a rear wheel drive car where it even oversteers a little bit. And you'll see that on some of those videos. So I test drove all those cars. I think there were four or five other cars I probably test drove also. Uh, that I eliminated. Uh, I think I drove the Lexus IS F Sport. Uh, I drove the new Jaguar XE. The Jaguar XE I would have been interested in. I really didn't want a new car because of the depreciation. Uh, and the dealer didn't have the bigger engine model there that I wanted. They just had the little 2.0 liter, which wasn't quick enough for me. So I kept coming back to this GLA 45 and I said, this is exactly what I want. I can fit four people in the back, fit my hockey equipment. It's all wheel drive. Uh, you know, another benefit I wasn't counting on was uh, the good gas mileage, and it's fast. So, the GLA 45s are pretty rare. There's not too many of them. You can find a million CLA 45s, but very few GLA. And again, GLA is basically the CLA, and they just made a shorter wheelbase, improved the uh, issues with the CLA, and it's not really a crossover, like I've said a million times. Think of it as a hot hatch, and if you don't want to think of it as a hot hatch, think of it as a wagon, because... That's what DMV told me in registration, it's a wagon. <laughs> so now, since a GLA is a rare car, it's very hard to find one to test drive. So even though I knew I wasn't gonna buy a new one, because that was out of my budget, my budget was 45,000, uh, all the new ones I saw were between 61 and 67,000. So what I did, and I hate to do this because I didn't really have an intention of buying it, is to go test drive a new one. The, the used ones were spread out. I think there were none in New Jersey. I found, uh, I wanted the Recaro seats and I found one in Rhode Island, one in Oklahoma, and I think one down in Virginia or Maryland somewhere and that one actually sold. So I went to my new car dealer and test drove it and I loved it. I thought it was phenomenal. So now it really just comes down to finding a car at the right price. I saw a lot of these used were about 49, 50,000. Luckily, I found this at Bergen County Maserati, which was great to me. I definitely recommend them. Uh, I'll post a link to their website, Bergen County Maserati in uh, Upper Saddle River, New Jersey. Asked for Nelson, who's the GM there. He was driving this as his, uh, basically his car. Uh, now, people don't go to buy GLA AMGs as a Maserati dealer. So that's another thing you gotta consider, supply and demand. If you go to your Mercedes dealer and they only have one of these cars, whether it's new or used, they're a Mercedes dealer and people are gonna be looking. All it takes is two people looking for this and then you have a greater demand than you have buyers and they're gonna sell that for top dollar. So when I went to my Mercedes dealer, there's a bunch of Mercedes dealers. Uh, yeah, I live in a populated area within a you know, 30 minute drive, I'd say there's three. 
of my house, and only, uh, I think, one of them had a GLA 45. So they're not going to give you any kind of discount. Uh, you could probably get, you know, on a $60,000 car, maybe three to 5000 over sticker. After a lot of negotiation, uh, they were giving me like 3500 off sticker for a new one. Maybe I could have got more than that, but really I'd have to get 10 off sticker to get anywhere close to my price range. But at the Maserati dealer, you know, people are going there to buy Maseratis. They sell a lot of high-end exotics like uh, Aston Martins, Ferraris, Lamborghinis. So nobody's going there to buy technically a crossover since only us car enthusiasts know that this is really a hot hatch. So I wound up getting a great deal. I wound up getting it for, I think, 44000 So essentially 17000 off a sticker with only 900 miles on it. But here are some other things you can do to get a good deal on a used car. First of all, check the date code on the tires. This is a new car, so it essentially has new tires, but if I can find it on here, this is a date code, and I'm gonna try to zoom in on it. You don't wanna use tires once they're five years old, because tires are made of oil, and they'll actually get hardened, and you'll lose performance. So this is a date code. This is on every single tire ever made. Okay, the first two numbers or the week in the year it was made. The last two numbers are the year it was made. So this is a 2015 model. It probably came out at the end of 14. So these tires were made in the 50th week of 2014. So these tires were made somewhere around December 20th, 2014. And they should be good, no problem, for five years, which would take us to 2019. Now, if you're looking at an old car, it may have old tires. Uh, I bought a 2004 S2000 a couple years ago. So let's say when I bought it, it was 12 years old. It had the original tires on it. And literally I drove home three hours from where I bought it and chunks came off the tire because those tires were so old and dry rotted. So that's something if I would have known, I couldn't negotiate it. I didn't realize the tires were that old. It was a low mileage car. The gentleman was older, a very nice guy, and he never changed the tires. If I would have known the first thing I had to do was buy tires, I could have negotiated that into the price. So when you buy a used car, ask the date code. And if you're buying from a dealer or an individual, they'll know you know what you're doing because only dealers ask that question. When I ask that question for date code, the second answer I always get is, are you a dealer? The second question I get is, are you a dealer? And no, I am not a dealer. Okay? So now we know date codes. We don't want tires that are five years old or older or older than five years. And again, you can negotiate. Remember, you're buying the car, you may keep it for years. I don't think the seller necessarily owes you a new set of tires, but if tires were a thousand bucks, maybe you get 500 bucks off and you're kind of splitting the difference for the new tires. Uh, the second thing you should do is get a gauge which will measure the uh, tires, right? So tires usually come in 30 seconds. So a tire, let's get out of the sun here. A new tire is probably eight thirty seconds, and you can probably drive that tire down to its two thirty seconds. Okay, I don't know. I'm not getting a good view on this picture here. All right. So what we do is we kind of put this flat on the tire. We put it in between in those grooves, and then we push down like this, and uh, it'll tell us how many how many thirty seconds. This is kind of a tight fit on this car, so this is not. We're going to do it on the bottom here. I don't know if you can see this or not, so forgive me. And if we look, and this is the first time I'm doing it, it says uh, almost 930 seconds. So this is literally a brand new tire. Uh, about 930 seconds it says. I don't know if that's facing you. And the reason, actually, it's more than that. It's uh, 1030 seconds. So that tire is literally brand new. Again, there's only 1,000 miles on this car, so it should be. If you're buying now a uh, used sports car and the rear tires last 10,000 miles, and it's at 230 seconds or 330 seconds, it needs to be replaced. So that's another thing you can negotiate uh, with the seller. Hey, the tires need to be replaced. Uh, maybe the seller didn't even realize that. And hey, I said the tires cost a thousand bucks. Maybe you split the difference $500 each, okay? And the third thing is, if you're buying a 20-year-old car, even if it's your dream Camaro, Mustang, 911, it probably has some paint work along the way. It could just be from something simple, parking lot ding, where they had to repaint the panel, or uh, you know, too many scratches on the front because the guy didn't have a clear bra. So you can get something like this, and this is actually a paint meter. And you put it on uh, different sides of the car, either on the side or on the top. So it should be consistent. You don't necessarily have to know how many microns were actually in that paint, but just look for consistency. So I don't know if, you, if this is gonna pick it up with the sun, but. 
I'm getting right now, uh, say I was getting 12 microns or 10, you just want to make sure the whole car reads the same, okay? So if it's 10, I think the unit of measurement is microns, forgive me because I forget. It should be 10 all around the car. And if we do it, it's 10 everywhere, okay? So this car had a clean Carfax. It doesn't look like it was in an accident because the paint meter is reading the same. And then uh, where it says top, if you were doing the hood, make sure it's not an aluminum hood where you won't get a reading or the roof. So every single panel on this car is matching exactly. All right. Yep, and that's 10. So all the panels measure 10 microns. So this car's never had any paintwork. So if it had paintwork, it would read 12 or 14 because what happened is there'd be another layer of paint on top of this car. Okay, and again, if you're buying a Camry and a Cord to Civic, if one panel was repainted, maybe the guy backed into something, I don't think that's a big deal. If you're buying a specialty car, you know, if you're buying a GT3 Porsche and you're paying 100 something thousand for it, you should know what panels have been repainted. And if the, uh, the seller might not even know because he might not be the original owner or he may not consider, you know, spraying the bumper as not having all original paint. So again, it, you, you get what you pay for. It's fine to buy a GT3 or a Viper that had a panel repainted or even been in an accident because it could be minor. But then you're not paying top dollar for that. You're gonna, you should pay the same as any Viper with a, a panel repainted. You should pay, pay the same for any M3 that was in an accident, okay? You know, if you buy a 50 year old car with original paint, it's probably worth a fortune. You're probably paying for a fortune for it. So if you want to drive that car, it's probably not the car to buy. It'd probably be better to buy one with a minor accident that had a little paint work that you can actually drive. Okay? Another thing we're going to do is we're going to run a Carfax. And not all accidents were on a Carfax. And the downside of Carfax is a little dense. You know, I've bought cars that had a little dent from an acorn running. If there's a police report, uh, for insurance purposes, it's done as a, an accident. I remember I had a car, I think once, that had a dent uh, from the previous owner. He parked at uh, the supermarket and a shopping cart dented it and he had it fixed and they had to do a tiny bit of paint work, but there was a police report for uh, insurance purposes and I got a copy of that police report, but Carfax said, too bad, it's still an accident because there's a police report. They don't care if the damage was a couple hundred bucks. So there's good size of Carfax and bad. So. Carfax is just a tool, but it's not the only tool, okay? And again, if the seller's honest with you and has all the service records, to me, that's the number one thing when I buy the cars, the service records. This car was a 2015, you know, it only had one service, so I have the record for that. All right, so it just shows you, uh, you know, do your homework, figure out the car that you need, be realistic of what your needs are, and then you can negotiate from there. Now, if you wanna know what a car is truly worth, First thing I do is go on the internet forums. I'm assuming if you're watching this video, you're a car enthusiast. So say you wanted to buy a Corvette. Join the Corvette forum and see what these cars are really selling for. You know, dealers are gonna be asking top dollar. So if you think you're gonna buy maybe a quasi collectible car and a rare car and it goes up in value, you're probably not gonna get, the dealer's already charging you top dollar for that car. So you're probably not gonna have a car that's gonna uh, go up in value. You probably have to pay that car from a private individual and then you'll be paying market value. If you, if you do it from a dealer, you're probably actually paying above market value. How do you know what the car's worth? Well, you can see what cars are selling for. Go on cars.com, auto trader, and see what the asking price is. Go on eBay and look for completed listings. That'll tell you cars that actually sold, which is powerful. Most cars don't actually sell on eBay. They're on there for exposure. So what you do is there's a button you can click that says completed listings and that'll show you that cars that actually sold and it's probably like, you know, 10% of the ones that are actually listed. Uh, bring a trailer is a good site. Uh, remember the buyer pays a commission. So if a car sold for 18.5 with that 5% is probably, you know, closer to 20,000 what that car actually sold for. And that'll be a market. If you go on the internet forums and you know a guy that bought a car or sold his car, I would email them and say, hey, I'm looking for that exact car. Can you tell me what it sold for? You can also go on Kelly Blue Book, and that'll give you private party values and uh, trade-in values for cars. And then I would kind of use the trade-in value and go up from there. Get an idea, you'll know the trade-in value by being able to look it up, and you'll know the retail value, but see, see what dealers with similar year and mileage are listing for their cars. Make sure you read the dealer's description carefully. Sometimes you'll see a price that's too good to be true and somewhere buried in the description of the car. 
it'll say it has a reconstructed title. That means the car's been rebuilt and probably worth a lot less. Okay? So this is uh, how to buy a used car. Hope you liked that video. Please sure to subscribe and share this with friends so we can keep this channel going. Uh, if you have any specific questions, uh, leave a comment below. And, uh, you know, if we have enough questions and there's a couple things I didn't mention, I can do a second video on it. Okay? Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for your support.